the construction of non-semi-central modular categories. All right, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I'm Chelsea Mulby. Uh, today I'm going to talk about joint work with Robert Lowitz. Uh, so there's joint work pertaining to this topic in these two papers. But I'll mostly focus on this paper because it's the most e theoretic, and this is a e theory workshop. Um, if you need notes, I have them all written up here, and you can email me and I can send you a copy if you want. And also, if there's time, I'll also talk about follow up work of Robert Lowitz and Guillermo San Marco uh, in this paper uh, if I have some time at the end. Um, as usual, feel free to stop me if you have questions. Hope to keep this down to earth. I don't expect that you know these words, so I'll spend a lot of time defining them. Yeah. Okay, so uh, first of all, why care about these words? What is a modular category? Well, what this is, is this is a, um, a certain, let's see, a certain uh, monoidal category that has rich structure. Okay, now, why care about this rich structure? Well, it's because it's used in a lot of applications, a lot of applications, so they're used to uh, cook up invariants of three manifolds. Uh, modular categories also appear uh, in the representation theory of BOAs. And as a result, there's a connection to uh, 2D conformal field theories as well. Uh, modular categories also appear in topological quantum computing. And also topological phases of matter. I don't actually know what these words are, but that's what you say. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, they play a role in subfactor theory. So uh, you see, they cut across topology, uh, mathematical physics, computer science, analysis, also algebra, <laughs> also algebra. <laughs> Uh, so that's why they're important. I mean, they cut across a lot of different fields. And you really need this rich structure um, for these applications. So, wow, I have a lot of board. Okay. Um, I've already talked about why care. <laughs> that's my motivation. Uh, the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, what are they. Okay, I have to define them. It's going to take a while, so bear with me. Uh, and then, I'll talk about how to build more. We care about them, so we want a lot of them. And maybe if I have time, I'll talk about how to build even more. Okay. Uh, I'm always gonna work over a field that's algebraically closed. Sometimes I'm gonna need some stuff about the characteristics, sometimes I won't. Any questions so far? All right, so what is a modular category? A category is modular, take this apart bit by bit. First of all, if it's, I would say, like the category of vector spaces over a field, meaning that I'm gonna need uh, the category to be Lewin, I want short exact sequences, I want finite co-products, I want zero, um, and I also want uh, the category to be k-linear. I want concepts to be vector spaces, so it's very much mimesis category. We also want certain finiteness conditions. Uh, for this, I want um, locally finite. So not only are the concepts vector spaces, the homsets are actually finite dimensional vector spaces. And I also want the category to be finite, meaning that you have enough projective and you have uh, finitely many simple objects of size and order. So you have a nice finiteness condition. All right, you also want the category not only to be like the category of vector spaces, but you actually want the category to be um, like the category of, let's say, representations of a Hopf algebra. Let me give you 
a fun and dimensional moss algebra. All right, so the main feature of this category is that it's mesoidal. It's mesoidal, meaning that we have a way of combining objects and combining morphisms. So if there's uh, an operation on it, by functor, we call this category C. There's a by functor that combines objects and morphisms, and there's also a distinguished object with which we call one, so that this triple behaves like a monoid. So reps of groups, reps of Hoff algebras have that structure. Uh, what's also nice about representations of uh, Hoff algebra is that the one doesn't really break apart. It's actually quite simple. It's a simple unit. Uh, and by this I mean, if I take all of the endomorphisms of one, it's isomorphic to the ground field K. And lastly, what's really cool about Hoff algebras is that there's a nice duality. Every representation has a dual representation. So we want that to hold in the category in general. In this case, we say that the category is rigid, meaning that there's going to exist uh, dual objects, and you have left duals and right duals for all of your objects in C. And they're going to be attached to uh, evaluation morphisms and co evaluation morphisms, et So all this put together, all this put together gives you that C is a so called finite tensor category. Where we're only halfway <laughs> to the definition. These, uh, these conditions are actually quite broad. Now, I am going to highlight that the original definition of a modular category actually required a bit more. I'm going to put this in a different color because um, we're not going to need it, but I have to point it out. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this was originally imposed. Ooh, this is our car. Okay. Originally imposed. Not needed. At least here. Maybe you'll need it in Richard's talk. It's only in Richard's talk. Uh, you want this category to behave like the category of representations of a semi simple Hoff algebra. Wow, that's so Okay. <laughs> uh, so you want the category to be uh, semi simple. Meaning that when you take um, any object, you can write it as a, a co-product of symbols. Okay, so everything can really be understood in terms of symbols, but we don't need that. Either. All right, so this again is it's pretty pretty broad. Doesn't really pertain to applications yet. What you need are three extra bits of data, three extra uh, bits of structure in order to define what a modular category is. We have additional, we have additional requirements. Uh, and again, this is really motivated for applications. They don't just come out of the blue. All right, so we have that, it behaves like a category of finite dimensional Hoff algebra. We get a finite tensor category. But we're also going to require that the category behaves like the category of finite dimensional Hopf algebra that's actually quasi triangular. Actually, quasi triangular. And what this does is it gives you um, a gradient. So, what that means is that there's going to exist some isomorphisms. Uh, which I'll call C, that allow you to swap across this tensor product. And it has to be compatible with the initial structure that you started with, or it has to be compatible with the monoidal structure. And I'm going to draw uh, my gradient like so. I draw diagrams going downward, 
sorry. Start when you write. When you write, you start at the top of the paper. Corey did. Okay, so <laughs> all right. So we have that behaves like the category of quasi-triangular Hopf algebras. Again, towards applications, we want a non-degeneracy condition, and you kind of have to pick your poison here for this. But in any case, this is going to behave like a category of factorizable Hopf algebras meaning that your category is non-degenerate, and you have some uh, equivalent conditions that give you this. There's a few, there's a few equivalent uh, conditions for this. I will say that um, in a semi-simple case, uh, that is given by the invertibility of a so-called S matrix. Are you going to use an S matrix tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, so you'll see you it. You want to decide. Okay, so you'll see it tomorrow. <laughs> so I would say uh, in a semi simple case, this really boils down to um, the invertibility of a so called S matrix. I don't need to do it. <laughs> All right? Because it doesn't really make sense in general, or at least not yet. What I'll say is, in general, um, what we're going to use is uh, the following. So what you do is you're going to collect all of the objects that break commute with every single other object. So, okay. So you collect all the objects that break commute with every single other object. This is called a Muger center, named after well, Muger. And we're going to require that this category is actually uh, equivalent to Vec. So what that means is that whenever you uh, double braid, oh man, screen, come on screen. This is x, this is y, and whenever you double braid and you get the identity for all y, you actually get that x is equal to 1, or isomorphic to 1. Okay, so that's the non degeneracy condition that we're going to use here. Okay, and all these equivalences that I keep talking about, they're really due to Shimizu, um, and that was established in 2019, so this stuff is kind of recent. The last bit that we're going to need is that um, this category behaves like the rest of a Hopf algebra that happens to be ribbon. So we get a ribbon category. Again, this is towards applications. And it's, yes. In the center, do you need the double braiding equal to identity or like maximum identity? All right, so for ribbon, what we want is there's some isomorphisms, which are called theta. No, I don't, I'm not really gonna use it. And you want it to behave well with the braiding, so you have that, I denote this theta like so. And we want that when I twist, it's equal to, first I twist and then double braid. And we also want this to be compatible with the rigid monoidal structure. Okay, so there it is. That's the definition. Any questions? What's non, 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 non semi single? Just get rid of this. Whenever you <laughs> give something complicated, you have to illustrate that these things actually exist. Okay. Uh, so some examples. So first of all, uh, I'm going to refer to all this 
business as a modular tensor category. And if I actually require semi-simplicity, I'm going to refer to this as a modular fusion category. So F stands for fusion. So I'm going to give examples of both. So I'm going to talk about modular fusion categories, examples of those, as well as examples of modular tensor categories. Okay, so we can build these from uh, Dreyfus doubles of groups. All right, so if I take a, a finite group and I take its Dreyfus double, that's an Itoff algebra. and I take its category representations, it's modular. So here we don't need anything about the characteristic of the field here. It's a nice example of a modular tensor category. Now, if we happen to require that the characteristic of the field doesn't divide the order of the group, then we get some simplicity and we get a modular fusion category. Okay, so those are some nice examples. We can also build these from quantum groups. Okay, so this is a lead theory conference, so I have to <laughs> talk about quantum groups. All right, uh, for uh, the general case, what you can do, or I would really say the non semi simple case, what you can do is just take reps of a uh, small quantum group out of room unity. category called a Valinda modular category. So what you do is you start off with uh, Lustig's big quantum group at a room unity. And then what you do is you take a subcategory of tilting modules Then what you do is you quotient out uh, by negligible modules. Yeah, huh. I spell that word this morning. Yeah, okay. <laughs> negligible, negligible, negligible <laughs> modules. And then what you end up getting is the semi-simple part. of this uh, rep category. That's a lot of moves. Maybe it's not a lot of moves according to some people, but this is a heck of a lot simpler, in my opinion. So, um, <laughs> this example really motivates our work here. All right? It seems that building modular categories uh, from quantum groups really uh, fits in with a non-semi-simple setting really well. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, are you assuming that the root of unity of is odd order? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to need it later. Yeah, let's take odd. Okay. But there are some cases where they build a root of unity sure. too. Okay. Actually, on the last page. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's generalize this. We can build even more examples. Uh, let's generalize the dream felt double setting. All right, so in order to do that, what we do is we start off with a finite tensor category, and we're going to build a modular tensor category from it in a very particular way that actually generalizes. So we start off with C, a finite tensor category, and we can at least get a braided, a nice canonical braided tensor category attached to this. That's going to be the so-called 
uh, Dreamfeld Center or the Noidal Center? Okay. And this actually happens to be a graded finite tensor category. In fact, it's actually non-degenerate as well. So it's one step away from being modular, from being driven. So why does it connect to this case? Well, for example, if I start off with C, B reps of uh, the same group, I get that uh, it's Dreyfus center is monoidally equivalent to uh, this category that we have over there, reps of a Dreyfus double. Okay, so now the question is, when is this monoidal center modular? Well, when is it written? Because we already get everything else for free. Well, um, okay, we're gonna break this up into the modular case, or the tensor case and the fusion case. If we happen to have that C is um, spherical in a way, so it's a finite tensor category, but it's actually spherical, then we get that the monoidal center is a modular tensor category. Now, I'm not, I have these initials here because this is actually due to uh, Douglas, Sean Priest, and Snyder. It's a very technical condition on a category. But what's cool is that it's exactly what you need for uh, this category to be modular. And that's actually due to Bergen Shimizu in 2018. Okay, so you do have some conditions that give you modular. Now this is actually built, or actually generalizes uh, the semi-simple case. We have a notion of spherically that's a a little easier to deal with. Maybe we don't even want to call this trace spherical because this notion uh, basically means that um, the left traces and right traces of objects are equal. Whatever traces mean left and so left trace of objects equals right trace of objects. And then with this notion of sphericality, we get a modular tensor category. This is due to Muger in 2003. All right, so we have a way of generalizing the Dreamfeld double setting, namely working with Dreamfeld centers to get modular tensor categories. Any questions so far? All right, now the goal, really the goal, the how do you build more with you? Does uh, PSPS spherical imply spherical? Oh, they don't imply each other, it's weird. There are examples where they, they are very different. Yeah, well, okay, let me, oh shoot, let me take that back. So DSPA spherical plus semi-simple, I think this recovers this, yeah. Well, you said it's going to be two, so. Yeah, so DSPA spherical plus semi-simple recovers this, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? So now what I want to do is generalize the quantum group setting. Okay, so we can also uh, generalize uh, the quantum group setting. Okay, so this is best done uh, by using kind of a version of this uh, Dreyfus center that's really due to Laos. We're only really going to deal with the general setting, or really the non semi simple setting here. I'm going to leave this alone because I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> I don't want to recover these types of examples. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, Lao Tzu's uh, relative monoidal center. So I have to explain what that is. It's a version of a dream focus. We need to take B to be a 
right of the category. And we want to connect these two categories, and we're going to do this by uh, using a braided monoidal plunger for one to a version of the other. So this is braided, and the center of this is braided. We're going to connect the two with the functor a G that goes from uh, basically this is V with the uh, reverse braiding. So instead of braiding over, we braid under. Okay, so we want this to be a faithful uh, braided tensor functor. Okay, so that's input data. And what is a relative monoidal center? Well, what it is is it's um, instead of a center, it's like a centralizer, like a centralizer. So it's a centralizer in the monoidal center of the image of this functor. So just to spell that out, this consists of all of the objects in the monoidal center that break and you with all objects in this image. Okay, and what Laut showed, just like in the, I guess, unrelative setting, you do pick up a braided finite tensor category. All right, let's do some examples. If I take my base to just be the category of vector spaces, really the only object you care about in that category is A or 1. You know, all, <laughs> all vector spaces are just copies of it in a way. So when I compute the relative monoidal center with this base, right, I'm picking up all the objects that break commute with every single other object, or, sorry, I mean, essentially, taking the base here to essentially be one makes this condition vacuous. Everything break commutes with one. So it doesn't really cut down Z of C. So we, we just recover the relative center. Let's take a more interesting example. This is going to be actually really key for us. Maybe let's take the base to be a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. Let's take B to be the category of representations of a quadrilateral Hoff algebra. If I take this base, it's a braided monoidal category, I could take a Hopf algebra in that braided monoidal category. So this is a Hopf algebra in the braided monoidal category. Take modules of that, again, in the, the monoidal category, and that's going to be the relative center that we're focused on. But what exactly is this category? I mean, this is actually pretty familiar. What you get is that this is actually isomorphic to a bosonization, or reps of a bosonization. So this is Rackers byproduct, or Majid's bosonization. Okay, so that is a relative monoidal center. But it's, it's pretty Hoffley. It's pretty Hoffley. So we don't recover Dreamfold doubles, but instead we recover braided Dreamfold doubles. So this is uh, isomorphic to reps of a braided Dreamfold double. Or instead of a bosonization, we get a double bosonization here. And uh, we also know that the category of reps of Dreamfold doubles are isomorphic to a category of Get a Dreamfield modules, there's a version of a Get a Dreamfield category here as well. 
but instead we have to work in this graded and modal categories. So this is all quite nice, um, but what does that have to do with, uh, let's say, quantum groups? So as an example of an example, I hope you can see this, if I take this small quantum group, it's actually, you can write it as a braided dream cell double. But here you have to take K to be the Cartan part. And here you take H to be the positive nilpotent part. All right. And in fact, in this case, what we get is that the bosonization is isomorphic to the positive Borel part. So the reason why um, this is useful is that this really handles, this uh, type of construction really handles reps of Hoff algebras that have a triangular decomposition. This is really good for. This is really good for. Uh, reps of Hopf algebras that have a triangular decomposition, like your quantum groups. Okay. Any questions? Okay, I have to give you a theorem. <laughs> Probably have to prove something. Okay, here's a theorem. So we know when um, Dreamfeld centers are modular, when a relative center is modular. So we need some input data. Input data is this finite tensor category, graded uh, finite tensor category, a way to connect the two, and we get a relative little center, and we want to say when is that modular. We already have that it's a graded finite tensor category. So what we're going to do is we're going to require B to not only be a braided finite tensor category, we're going to require that it's non-degenerate, e.g. we can take it to be modular. We want to use Shabiz's result, so we're going to require C to be that notion of spherically. Yes, DSPS spherical. And then we have uh, G uh, as above require anything new. And uh, the theorem is that this all uh, gives you that your relative monodal center is a modular tensor category. All right. So how does this work? Well, um, we already have that this relative monodal center is a braided finite tensor category that's due to Wallace. 2018. Okay, so we have all this data. <laughs> Baby, okay? So we need non degenerate and we need rivet. All right, we have that the center is now rivet. Okay, this is due to uh, Shimizu again. actually have that this relative modal center, this is actually a full subcategory of the ordinary center. So that gives us that the relative center is also ribbon. Okay. Three. Okay, we need one more step here. Now we need non-degenerate. So for this, we're going to compute this Muir center. All right, and uh, this actually takes some work, which I'm burying. We actually have to show this. But this is actually equivalent to the Muir center of the All right, and 
of course, since B is non-degenerate, we get that that is equivalent to VEC, and then we're good. Then we have that the relative center is non-degenerate. All right, and that is the proof in a nutshell. Any questions? Yes? Um, do, you, do you know if the, the relative center of the relative center is the thing you started with? Yeah, yeah so we have a double central oh, okay. there. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a double centralizer here that we apply. Anything else? Okay. Oh, have some time. We actually have a nice uh, decomposition theorem as well. So um, there's a way of decomposing modular. to myself. So let's assume we have these hypotheses over here. And we're also actually going to assume now that B is modular. Okay, so what we end up getting is a nice decomposition of modular tensor categories. Um, so we get that the relative center is equivalent to uh, the rate of B. This is a Deline product. It's a way of combining the noidal categories. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty harmless construction. And what's left over is this relative center. Okay, this is actually all equivalent as modular tensor categories are really boils down to being equivalent as rate of all right, so um, and so this is akin to um, Newer's decomposition of uh, modular fusion categories. It really builds on his work. Let me give an example. So um, let's take the Drinkfeld double of this bosonization. Pairing on with this example, we have K to be a quasi-triangular Hoff algebra. We have H to be Hoff algebra in this category, right? So we can form the bosonization or Rapper byproduct. Let's take the Drinkfeld double of it, and we get that it's modular. And this actually is equivalent to uh, the category of reps of K, maybe with this uh, reverse braiding, and this category of um, modules over the braided Greenfield double. So, I mean, at least the generators match up nice. So, if you take the generators as a vector space, I mean, this kind of has generators H and K, and then you got um, another copy. Well, you have a copy of K dual, and you have a copy of H dual, and then here you have copy of K, and then this has a nice triangular decomposition. And you can identify one of these Ks with K dual. Things sort of match up. Uh, and as an example of this, uh, we have that, if I take the Drinkfeld double of uh, the positive Borel part, uh, that's isomorphic to um, or I take reps of it. This is equivalent to reps of the Carton part, the lane product with uh, reps of your quantum group. Okay, as modular cat categories. Any questions so far? Give some concluding remarks. Mm, where? Maybe over here. If I can't use 
that board anymore, right? I'm yeah. off limits. <laughs> okay. Off limits. There's a lot to do with this construction. So um, we actually, we recovered the fact that uh, reps of a small quantum group is an NPC, but we really did this for an odd Ruby entity. Okay. Um, now what's open really is extending this results the either Ruby in any case. Okay, so ribbonality is a kind of the tricky thing that messes you up and I fixed ribbonality but it was down here. Right, so that is an open problem. You want to think about that. Secondly, um, we also have in this paper that, I mean as soon as you deal with reps of a quantum group, if you wanted more Hopf algebras that look like it, you might want to consider Nichols algebras and the other Greenfield categories, take the long equation, blah, blah, blah. So we have a solution of conditions uh, for when if I take a, a Nichols algebra, this is a Nichols algebra, Take the category of mom, mom cells. <laughs> Take the Dreamfield, graded Dreamfield double of it in a uh, category of uh, reps of a group over a finite dimensional or a finite uh, abelian group. There's Nichols algebra uh, in this category. I can end up building this Hoff algebra, and this is a generalization of, um, let's say, this picture here, or a specialization of it. I can take the category of modules of it. Well, that's equivalent to one of these relative modal centers. And now we need a bosonization. I know when that's an NPC. Okay, so um, we need a condition on the symmetric bilinear form attached to G. That's going to give us a non degeneracy condition. And there's a technical condition on the top degree of your <coughs> algebra, um, as well as the R matrix of this quasi triangular Hopf algebra that gives you the ribbonality. So it's a little technical, but we do have conditions. We have sufficient conditions. But necessary conditions are open. Okay. And then lastly, I mean these Nichols algebras are they're cool. They're thoroughly studied. There's tons and tons and tons and tons of papers on them including whole like dictionaries that are 100 pages long. <laughs> but they essentially fall into three types. Um, so there is the uh, Carton type, which is like um, quantum groups, basically. There's a super type that pertains to super Lie algebras. And there's a, I guess, the exceptional type, or sometimes they're called the UFO type, or History. <laughs> I can't really roll into any, any cases. Um, so we, we've talked about the Carton type, but in the super type, we gave some examples of modular tensor categories in the paper that uh, fall into this case. But um, Robert Lawitz and Guillermo San Marco really, really studied this case in type A. So this was thoroughly examined. Examined. Again, 
um, type A uh, by Robert Lowitz and Guillermo San Marco, they get lots of examples of modular tensor categories. And remember at the beginning I said that modular tensor categories were good for something, they had all these applications. They actually get some cool knot invariants with these modular tensor categories. And these are actually, I mean, they're not enial knot invariants, but they're, they're actually indistinguishable, or let's just say four knots, uh, indistinguishable uh, by your Jones polynomials, not your Jones, <laughs> Jones polynomials or von Black polynomials. between these two Hoff algebras? Yeah, can you get one from the other? Uh, so basically you, you, you take a quotient of this Hoff algebra by identifying these two copies of K. So get this. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, so, I mean, because you're dealing with non-semi-simple category, right? So the dimension likely to be zero on all of them. That means the dimension of the, the global dimension of the category. Quantum dimension, yeah. So that means you lose all the equation of dimensions in, uh, in the uh, compared to the semi-simple case. Is it right? Yeah. You, you probably cannot use any of these yeah. uh, dimensions to compute, let's say, uh, the dimension of the, mm -hmm. the relative double. <coughs> So yeah. probably is zero if you're doing So yeah, so case. we're talking about quantum dimension of a, of a category. And yeah, so for in a non-semi-simple case, you do get zero yeah. a lot of the time. And that was actually kind of a, a tricky point in this other paper we wrote that constructs non-semi-simple modular categories from local modules because you tend to want to take local modules over an algebra that has um, a non-zero quantum dimension. So we kind of had to work around that. So you end up, when you censor it, you, you turn it to zero, zero times. <laughs> and that's okay. I mean, yeah. if you care about dimension. Yeah, i just curious, it's, uh, because yeah. it's, it's, it's used a lot in, for example, the, this numeric framework approach, who appears. But interestingly enough, I mean, there still are lots of papers using non semi simple modular <laughs> categories to get uh, invariants and manifolds, even with this zero point. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you. I mean, whenever you generalize, you have to pay a price. <laughs> that yeah. is, that I mean, is one of the prices. You gain something new. What I mean. Yeah. You lose something, you gain something. Yeah. But Frobenius Perron dimension still works out well. So you still work well, right? Yeah. So we have we computed Frobenius Perron dimension. Mm -hmm. These uh, categories there. Yeah. Um. So if you start with e and you say non semi simple, is it possible that a centralizer is semi simple? I don't know. That's a good question. Tensor with a non semi simple one, both of them are modular, then you centralize the non semi simple one. Well, but could that be a Grunfeld tensor or something? Yeah. When you do that tensor. I think you could, you could create such a system. It's kind of perverse, though. Could a semi simple modular category be equivalent to a non semi simple No, no, that would be so. That's what we're saying. But that's that's one of the questions we have in our local models. Wait, wait, you yeah. said we're like curious about semi-simple what equivalent with weight equivalent? equivalent. Weight equivalent. Well, that's then, that's then, then I don't know what to. Yeah, answer. so that's a question that we we pose in our second paper. Oh, okay, so that's an open. Yeah, that's open. Okay. Then, <laughs> yeah, that's 
that's uh, be nice if that's not true. You know, everything kind of stays in their own silos, but who knows? So that should be incredibly interesting if that were true. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel possible all of these are able to get this and get this for a Like you can read them the whole time. Yeah, let me follow up on the question. So can you can you actually use the triangulated structure to say anything more? Right, that, that's what I was getting. Like if you want a dimension, yeah. if you can get your some projected plane size, mm -hmm. which unfortunately though, I'm getting about a million notes of data dimension for a triangulated right. That's right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Right. I think Morgan's 